Ukraine has used its new long-range ATACMS missiles for the first time in the war, while Russia counterattacks amid the world's distraction in the wake of war in Israel. My name is Jerome Starkey, I'm the defence editor at The Sun newspaper and this is your weekly roundup of the most important news of the war in Ukraine. We'll start with the use of the ATACMS missiles. Ukraine appears to have launched a number of strikes on Russian airfields inside occupied Ukraine in Lugansk and Berdyansk, destroying at least nine Russian helicopters, according to Ukraine's special operations forces, hitting an ammunition warehouse and damaging or destroying the runways where those aircraft were parked. This is significant because it's the first time that Ukraine appears to have used these new army tactical missile systems which were given by the United States last month. Ukraine had long been asking for these missiles because they have an increased range. They are fired from the GMNRS or the HIMARS rocket launchers which Ukraine already has. Uh, there are two types of ATACMS missiles. One has a range of just over 100 miles and one has a range of about 190 miles. Now we understand that the ones Ukraine has have the range of about 100 miles. That's significantly longer than the 70 mile range of the regular HIMARS missiles which they've been using up to this point. It's not however their longest range munition. We know that they have the Storm Shadow and Scalp cruise missiles, air launch cruise missiles, which have been given by France and the UK, and those have already been use, in use in Crimea to significant and spectacular effect against the headquarters of Russia's Black Sea Fleet and indeed against the uh, dry docks, the repair docks, where uh, a caliber class, uh, crew, uh, caliber class submarine uh, was destroyed and a Rapucha class landing ship was destroyed as well as the headquarters of Russia's Black Sea Fleet. Nonetheless, having a long-range ground-launched missile with such a range that can be fired from a mobile launcher is a significant development, significant edge to Ukraine's capability in the fight. And what we're seeing is a continuation from Ukraine's point of view of an attempt to degrade Russia's fighting capability with long-range strikes behind the front lines, taking away their opportunities to resupply, hitting an ammunition dump. We've seen them hitting headquarters, uh, hitting significant high-value Russian military assets. Nonetheless, what we've seen from the Russian side is a series of counterattacks. Russia is showing that it is certainly not out of this fight. And indeed, in Kupiansk, in the northeastern front, Russia has continued this onslaught of ground offensives, uh, which has been going on in Kupiansk now for many, many weeks. We're seeing an uptick in Marinka, which is a suburb just west of occupied Donetsk. And again, also, around Avdivka. Now there appears to have been a significant escalation in the Russian assaults to try and surround and capture Avdivka. Those attacks increased significantly in the immediate aftermath of the Hamas massacre in Israel on October 7th. Now it's not clear if those two events are connected but certainly one of the things we have to consider today is what impact events in Israel are likely to have on the war in Ukraine. Now Russia may well have been using the fact that the world was distracted, uh, attention was on Israel, for it to launch this attack on Avdivka or it could have been coincidence. Nonetheless, we have to consider the effect of what is happening in Israel on the war in Ukraine. The world is completely consumed, distracted by the aftermath of that horrific massacre, the October 7 massacre by Hamas militants inside Israel that has left at least 1,400 people, mostly civilians, including women, children and infants, dead. The impact of such a spectacular, devastating, horrific massacre by Hamas fighters inside Israel has been to take up the oxygen of the world's attention, to divert uh, much of the world's attention to what is happening in Israel and away from Ukraine. Now that is potentially uh, to the advantage of President Vladimir Putin as he hopes, as he relies on trying to outlast Western resolve, indeed trying to outlast the West's attention span. Today, President Putin has landed in China and has been photographed standing shoulder to shoulder with President Xi Jinping at the 10th anniversary of his Belt and Road Initiative. Now, 
both President Putin and President Xi Jinping potentially standing to gain from the chaos uh, that may be about to unfold in the Middle East as Israel threatens to wipe out Hamas and international watchers fear other countries may be drawn into that conflict. This is President Putin's first visit outside the countries of the former USSR since he was indicted on war crimes by the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Now, of course, President Xi Jinping has previously promised a friendship with no limits with Moscow, but in fact, that promise has not borne the results that Russia would have liked. We know that President Putin wanted more support from China for his war in Ukraine. Crucially, what he needed was for China to turn on the supplies of weapons and ammunition. And so far, we understand that Beijing has not done that. That has forced President Putin to look further afield, most notably to North Korea, which is why he invited Kim Jong-un of North Korea to Russia uh, at the end of this summer. President Putin therefore in China, likely to be asking Beijing for more support. Whether or not that will be forthcoming remains to be seen. Ukraine soaking up those Russian attacks, continuing its long range assaults behind the front lines. As ever, we'll do our best to answer your questions. We had a couple from our last episode. Thank you very much. Uh, many of them about the fate of Admiral Viktor Sokolov, of course, the commander of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, who Ukraine initially had said was killed in its strikes on that headquarters in Sebastopol. He later appeared in a video conference uh, with Russia's Ministry of Defense. A lot of speculation as to whether or not that was genuine footage or whether he'd been sort of recycled. He didn't. He appeared to blink in the footage, but he didn't speak and Russia also released footage showing him talking at a sports event, but that sports event we know happened before the missile strike. The short answer is whether or not he is alive or dead remains unclear, unproven. Certainly, were he alive and well, we might have expected to see more convincing proof of that in the time between now and that strike. So whilst it's unconfirmed, it would suggest that he was certainly harmed or indeed may have been killed as Ukraine initially claimed. Another question as to whether, you know, does Ukraine have any realistic chance of resisting the behemoth, the might of such a huge neighbour as Russia? It's a good question because often, invariably, conflicts come down to logistics. Which country can supply the money, uh, the men and women, uh, the weapons and ammunition to sustain the fight? That is a question of scale and size and Russia has that on its side but of course it's also a question of will and allies and, and Ukraine has that on its side. Uh, Ukraine continuing to show the will to fight and so far its allies continuing to show the will to support it but as ever and I've said this before I think the single greatest threat to Ukraine is the resolve of its international allies. As ever, if you have any questions, please ask them in the comments below and we will endeavour to answer them in our next episode next week. Thank you.